So, uh, hi, um, thank you for speaking to us. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. We're training, actually. There, there's no lockdown over here. Okay. Uh, our league starts on Sunday, so I'm excited for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I like the flag in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Strategically um, placed. Yeah. So you grew up in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, which is known for its strong Arab uh, community. Uh, what was that like, sort of growing up in that environment? Uh, it was... Dearborn's fantastic. Um, I grew up in a family of uh, four, so I'm the youngest, and uh, we all played soccer. We all played football, um, and my dad was the coach. My mom used to cheer us on. Um, we all used to play for the same team, actually, uh, and we're really close in age, so that, that worked out, and that helped me develop. Um, but Dearborn, Dearborn's, I think, a place that I want to live in in the future, even though everyone there wants to get out. Uh, there's just something about it. I really like the community. I like how uh, there's a lot of Arab over there. And when I go to Beirut, I see a lot of things that are like, oh, that makes sense now. That's why that place is called a Station or, you know, so yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um so growing up, who were like the biggest influences on you in terms of like trying to make it as a professional footballer? Uh, my, my favorite player of all time, the player I grew up watching, the player that my dad used to love and, and uh, pull us out of school. We used, to, we used to get pulled out of school to watch these Champions League games, Zinedine Zidane. Okay. Um, yeah. There's just, uh, for me, he's the greatest of all time. I'm watching the Michael Jordan documentary. Uh, and he's uh, for me he's like he's the best um the real ronaldo uh, R ronaldo uh what's his last lima um he, yeah. he really was a great striker um i liked michael owen and that kind of helped me uh to like liverpool um watching him play and that, that helped me as a striker uh but i think the cake goes to zidane okay <laughs> and um so you, I, I, looking at like your career, I feel like you've always been very decisive and sort of taking that next step. You like, I think you left home when you were sixteen or something like that. When you went to the uh, the academy in, in Florida, was it? Yeah, the uh, Bradenton then, Academy. Yeah, and then you went uh, after one year uh, at, at university. You went to uh, you, you you made the move like you tried to make it in Europe, I think, and then you joined the MLS and. It sort of like feels like it's a pattern where every time you were doing well, you kind of straight away went for that move. Um, how difficult are these kind of decisions to make? And what was it that pushed you to, to kind of keep going to the next step? I think my, my dream as a kid, every single thing that every single time we were asked in school, what do you want to be when you grow up as a professional soccer player, professional footballer? Um, and... I mean, my dream was to play in Europe. Before I went to the University of Michigan, I had an offer uh, with a German team, Mainz. Um, yeah. And it was between that and the university. Uh, my brother was playing at the university at the time. He was a year, he's a year older than me. And I kind of made the decision to go, the, go, go to University of Michigan and to then play. Yeah, you could always play professional afterwards. Um, in hindsight, I'm not sure how that worked out. Um, maybe we wouldn't be talking. I wouldn't be playing for the national team um, if that was the case. Because I think uh, around that time, a lot of young Americans were being scouted by Jurgen Klinsmann. Um, if I had taken my career to Europe, uh, I could have developed in different ways. And Germany is notorious for, for developing yeah. players. Um, but I, I ended up going to Michigan. Um, I did well there. And I said, you know what, I, wanna, I need to play professional. And, and I, I tried to go back to Europe. The offer wasn't there. Settled down in the MLS. Um, but I, I really think decisions on, on, on that scale need to be made. I mean, you, for example, like the decision to come to Korea. Uh, I could have waited along. I could have uh, stayed with Ansar. Um, or tried to stay, tried to, to figure out a solution. But like, in a footballer's career, you have to make that decision. And sometimes the, the club that's waiting for you isn't going to wait. They got another player. 
So yeah. it's really important to be decisive, um, know what you want, and, and go for it. And um, so that first year playing in, uh, in the university, you quickly became like, sort of, if I can say, the star of the team. Uh, I mean, you, you, as you said, there was your brother there as well with you. And, uh, and then you played for, I think it was that year, the U.S. under-20s national team? I did, yeah. I had and, and you scored. my debut. Yeah. And um, so uh, tell us what that year was like and how did you kind of make sure you stayed focused and not kind of get too excited as it was going so well? If I'm going to be honest, I, I did get a little bit too excited and I let my, my guard down when it came to school. I was always an A student. Um, and when it, when it came to that first year in, in university, uh, I mean, football was everything. I, I kind of forgot about school for a minute. And uh, when the under 20 call up came, I think I had finals or something. And I, I didn't message my professors saying that I was going to be gone with the national team. I ended up missing my final. Um, and that kind of, that was a wake up call for me that I need to be on top of things. Um, but I mean, with success, it's important to always stay uh, grounded. And I think my father did, my parents did an amazing job of always keeping me humble and not letting things like that get to my head. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I can't say that I didn't get too excited because I did. Um, but I was ready. I was ready to play professional. I was ready to, I mean, you, you see young players going on the big stage and that's important in a, in a player's career uh, is to play professional as young as possible. Uh, you get those extra years and under your belt and you can really, really progress. And uh, so you, as I said, we, you were playing with your brother and you also had uh, Justin Maram, who's now Iraq, Iraqi national team player in the team. What, what was it like playing all, all the three together and kind of what was your relationship like? They called us the three Habibis. <laughs> uh, playing with Justin was great. Playing with my brother, I mean, for me, my brother is more talented than, than me. I think a lot of people would say that. Um, and having him on the field when he was on the field was one of the, the highlights of my career uh, so far. I mean, his vision is unreal. His left foot, he's right footed and, and his left foot is better than his right foot. He would take corners with his left foot. Um, you know, it, it was really fun. The chemistry was there. We accounted for a lot of the goals. Hats off to the rest of the team. I mean, we put in a lot of great performances as a team, but I think in my career, it's a trend that when I have a good supporting cast around me, when we play good attacking football, um, then I can be really, really dangerous and uh, I can be successful. And uh, so when did you first hear of interest from the Lebanese national team? I think it was when I had signed with Kansas City. Um, I remember receiving a couple phone calls from these 961 numbers. Um, and I was like, I don't know what to do about it. And I had still, I was still on the, on the fence with the U S national team because I, I was in the, in the, in the, the seventeens, I was in the twenties for a little bit. Um, I mean, the United States, if you look at it, just, compare both teams. The United States always makes the World Cup apart from the last one. Um, the exposure is there. There's a lot of money there. Um, but I think there was, there was a time when I was with Kansas City that I wasn't playing as much. Um, I think I, I felt, I felt hu held back. And I wanted to play football. I just wanted to play. And I wanted to play any chance that I got. So I had received a call from Lebanon. I, I remember sitting down on the couch with my dad, and he was like, are you, you ready to do this? You, you, you can't play for these states anymore. I said, yeah, let's do it. Like, I just want to play football. And, I mean, I was excited. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, my first camp, I think it was in Qatar. We played against uh, Oman, I think, Oman. Yeah. And, I mean, the guys were great. Theo Booker was the coach. He liked me immediately. Um, and I think because I had gone to Germany before, because I was familiar with the German style, that was maybe why he, he took a liking to me. 
and why I um, adapted well to whatever he was trying to implement to the team. Um, and I mean, once you make your cap, you can't go back. So, yeah. so uh, I had accepted my fate at that point, And I didn't realize at that point that that Asian passport, that Lebanese passport, uh, opens the doors to a lot of different, uh, I guess, countries in Asia, which is what led me to, to Thailand and what led me to Korea. Yeah. So, so I guess everything happens for a reason and I'm really happy that I made that decision. I don't think I would, like going back, I wouldn't change it. And uh, what do you think of the way sort of the national team finds diaspora players? Do you think, like, should, should there be more access or is it actually the way it's done is, is good now? I think, of course, there, there's ways to improve. Um, I do believe a big part of uh, success comes from dedication and uh, investment into uh, the facilities and the federation itself, the players. Um, if you look at Lebanon, I'm not sure. If, do you live in Lebanon? Uh, no, but I, I go there a lot, so... So you're familiar with the facilities that we have and, yeah. and kind of, you know, I think there's so many great players in Lebanon and a lot of them can play for the national team that, that aren't, that are getting overlooked. A big problem is the way that we play the game over there. Most of the fields are artificial. You see Medina Riyadi is most of the times garbage. Yeah. Um, and it's nothing against the groundskeeper, nothing against anyone that works there. Um, it's just things need to be better. There has to be a system in place um, to give the players the best possible ways to succeed. Um, and if you look at it now, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, that needs to change. Uh, but in regards to scouting, I think uh, with people like you, with, with a lot of with social media now, it, it's growing. A lot more exposure is, is getting out. A lot player, a lot of Lebanese players are getting exposed and helping the national team. Um, case in point, the Melky brothers yeah. um, and, and other players that I might be forgetting at the moment. But I mean, I think there's a system in place. If we can tweak it and, and work at it, uh, it, it would be really beneficial. And ultimately, I think there needs to be a, a big change when it comes to facilities and uh, in ways that we play the, the game in Lebanon. And uh, coming from the United States, are you sort of surprised that there's not more Lebanese players from there coming to the national team? Not real. I mean, all I know, all I know is, I mean, I know there's a lot of Lebanese in the States, but um, I know most of the Lebanese are in Dearborn. Yeah. Uh, and I know that a lot of them do have aspirations to play for the national team. Um, the problem is you have to go through the, the proper steps and, and, and football is lucky in that sense where, I mean, you could, you could be a great player, case in point, my brother. And if you don't have the right team, the right uh, surroundings, the right coach that likes you, the right formation, uh, the right city, things just might not work for you as a footballer. Um, I think a lot of players, a lot of Lebanese players in the States do want to play for the national team. Um, they just need to go through the proper channels and play consistently with a team, whether that be USL, MLS, anywhere around the world for that matter. Because uh, ultimately that, that's what the national team is about, is getting the best players that are performing at the best level with their club. Um, and if we see more of that in the States, I mean, that's good. But, and while playing in the States, did you come across other Lebanese players that kind of you thought may, maybe were good enough? In the MLS, I, I think I was the first Lebanese player. Um, yeah. USL, I don't remember another Lebanese player. So uh, the only thing I can remember maybe is is playing pickup in Dearborn. Yeah. <laughs> playing pickup soccer. And, and there are a lot of skilled players, I'll tell you that. A lot of skilled Lebanese players. Um, so, uh, I mean, unless they play for a team, I think it's really hard for yeah. a national team coach to select them. And uh, so when you first went to the national team, what were your impressions, your first impressions? The guys were great, really welcoming. Um, my impression at first was, okay, I, I can do this, and I'm really excited to do this. I mean, it was an honor. Uh, 
stepping foot in Lebanon for the first time since I was a, I think one or two years old, that was the last time that I had been in Lebanon fast forward 18 years. And I was like, wow, wow, this place is beautiful. Uh, the people are beautiful. The food is amazing. Um, and the players, I mean, they were talented. They are talented. Lebanese players have a lot of skill. Um, we just, I think we need the guidance in, in proper coaches and proper uh, youth systems uh, to help us maybe make a World Cup. But my first impression was, was really positive and I was really proud to, uh, to put on that national team jersey. And how easy was it to like settle into the team and how different was the style of play compared to what you knew from the States? International play is so much faster than what, what you play domestically or with your club team. I mean, everyone tries very hard uh, and that's natural. Um, everyone uh, is skilled. Everyone plays physical. Um, so, I mean, my, my impression was the level here is good. We have something. We have a bunch of good players, young players at the time, um, that could maybe make a World Cup push. Um, but the, the level was good. I thought maybe initially, tactically, we were a little bit lower place. Um, but I, I think with time, that changes with any team uh, when you have new players. Uh, it's not like we train together every day. So for what, what yeah. we had, um, it was good. It was a good level. And uh, so uh, I don't know if you've seen, but uh, Justin Ram spoke about Iraq and how he's had like problems kind of uh, combining playing in the States and playing for the national team. So did you find that difficult as well? <laughs> At first I didn't. Um, and then uh, I started to, to sense some issues from my, my club in Kansas City. Um, I mean, the coach or, or clubs, I mean, it's against FIFA law to prevent a player from going. Yeah. Um, but I got the sense that every time I was called up to the national team, I took a, I took a black mark on my record, um, putting, you know, putting that travel, that long travel, that, uh, that I guess, strenuous, uh, fatigue on my body and the coach maybe kind of uh, looked the other way on on starting lineups uh, following my uh, my arrival um, I remember when I was with the in the USL I had a game on Sunday and I had a tra I traveled on Monday to Kuwait this was recently um, this is when we were on our streak of not losing we, we hadn't lost the game with uh, Radulovic um, I traveled on Monday, arrived on Tuesday, trained Tuesday night, really light, Wednesday trained, Thursday started in the game, uh, played 50 something minutes, and then left the next day back to the States. And I hadn't even, the jet lag was still, I was jet lagged the whole time I was there. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty strenuous. I, I understand why Justin, um, you know, says that his body's taxed and sometimes that travel is too far, especially for one or two games. Um, and that's also what kind of led me to, to signing in Thailand um, was being closer to the national team. I mean, it wasn't that much closer, but um, at least if there was a game in Korea, which we did play here in Ansan when I was in Thailand, it was like a three hour flight. Amazing. Yeah. I got in before the team and I remember it was like, I was like, this is it. This is perfect. Yeah. And um, so you said that Theo Booker was the coach who first called you up. Since then, you, you've had Giannini, Radulovic, and now Liviu. How would you compare these coaches in terms of their style? I wasn't able to, I think Theo Booker was going through contract negotiations. The Federation didn't want to extend it. I wasn't able to see his style more, um, apart from the first camp that I was called up. Um, we had Giannini. And man, I, I'm not, I don't want to be a negative person. I don't want to talk bad about anyone, but I just don't think that he understood um, the players at all. I mean, there, there's funny stories that I have maybe another time we can talk about um, where the, I mean, 
just there was a classic, the, the lack of basic respect for his players. Um, I could sense Giannini. And, and I remember the game we beat Thailand in Thailand 5-2. to two. Um, He kept saying push for a goal, push for a goal. And we had already qualified with that score. It kind of left us exposed. We conceded a goal. And that ultimately was uh, what knocked us out of the, the Asia Cup. Um, Fast forward to Radulovic. Um, I think his intentions were good. Um, and I think that he had a really defensive style of play, uh, which, is, which can work at the international level. Um, but when you have players like uh, Matu, like Mohamed Haidar, Ataya, you have good attacking players. Uh, and they have chemistry too. I mean, you, you can watch it on the field, but, you know, the one-twos that they play. Um, I felt like he could have utilized that a lot more. Um, and then the new coach, uh, Levu, I like him a lot. I think he understands the, uh, I guess, the culture of Lebanese football. Um, he's not too hard on us, uh, and he respects us. Ultimately, that's the number one thing. I mean, players don't want to play for a coach that swears at them or cusses them out. Yeah. Um, or cusses their mothers out, uh, which Radulovic had done one time to me. Um, and I know Serbian. I know um, I have Serbian friends, and I, I called him out. I said, listen, my friends are Serbian. You can't tell me that. He said, oh, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but most of the time, I, I could sense that he wasn't joking. Uh, like I said, his intentions were good. Um, he had a real, really defensive style of play. Um, I can't wait to see what this new coach uh, has to offer more. I liked what I saw at the uh, what's the East Asia or what was it? The West, West Asian Asia? Championship, yeah. West Asia Championship. Um, I thought that with the little time that he had, he brought in something different, and I think a lot of people noticed it. I was reading comments saying that I mean we're starting to play football again, um, so I think the future is bright. Uh, we just have to have uh, the federation to get behind us and to give us the, I guess, the tools to succeed. And uh, so how would you compare the atmosphere in the team between when you first joined and now? I'm a lot more comfortable with the guys. Before I was a little, little quiet kid. I didn't know any Arabic. I didn't know if someone was talking about me. Um, now my Arabic is, is, is pretty decent. Um, so I'm able to joke with the guys. I know guys personally. I've played against them in the league as well. Um, and I get along with the foreigners, too, because, I mean, technically, I've lived in the States my whole life. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of team chemistry. Um, the culture is good. Um, it's, it's something good to, to build on. And uh, who, who would you say are the big characters in the group? Uh, Joan, <laughs> Joan Omri, big character. Um, uh, Matu is really is a quiet guy, uh, really respectful. Um, Adnan Haider is a funny guy, even though you, you would look at him and you would say this guy is, this guy doesn't talk at all. Um, he, he's got a good personality. Um, I'd say most, all of the guys on the team have a good personality, have good hearts. And uh, if you talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, you know, you, you can get a good laugh and, and understand them. Um, and that, that's what I like about the national team. There's not like one guy or a couple guys or a group of guys that are like, you know, in their own world. Um, and I think that's what makes any great team uh, even better. And so looking at your own time with the national team, you've kind of been in and out. Would, would you say we've seen the best of you in a national team shirt? I would say def definitely not. You have not seen the, the best of me. Um, uh, I think hopefully, uh, when this Corona stuff settles down and I'm playing games with my team here, um, I'm able to get back up to the level that I was, um, and kind of take it up a notch. Uh, I think you saw a little bit of the best of me when I started to play for Ansar. Um, yeah, I want to replicate that. That's what actually kind of brought me to Ansar was it was a small challenge that I was like, man, the, Le the Lebanese fans, they don't know what I can do. And I wanted to show them. And I, I think I got a, you know, 
I did pretty well in, in showing what I can do. And I want to replicate that with the national team. Uh, I think it's safe to say I haven't done that yet. Um, but I mean, I'm still kind of young and there's definitely a lot of games ahead. So hopefully I can do that. And I mean, we've seen you play in several positions. So I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what is your best position? Like, where do you feel more comfortable? I grew up playing in, in, as a striker um, in a 4-4-2. And that's where I was most successful when I played with Justin Merrim up top uh, as a second striker. Um, I played in Kansas City as a left winger uh, in a front three. I can play left, center, right. But for me, I've always ad identified as a striker as a forward. Um, I think my last game with Ansar, I was playing center midfield. <laughs> and I mean, I can play center midfield. You know, I think I can play any position. I can play center back if the coach asked me to. Um, but you're not going to get the best out of me uh, playing anywhere other than striker or maybe left winger. And um, so what I wanted to ask you is, out of all the attacking players that we have in the national team, so you mentioned a few, um, who do you think you kind of play best with? Um, I like playing with Hilal. I, I think uh, Hilal was good. Um, I played good. I played, I played really well with, um, with Mohamed Kadu. Um, I think, I mean, it's really hard. I, with with Hassan Matu, um, I'm not. I'm personally not used to a player being individual and, and you know making a solo play. Um, I also I, I think I played really well with Mohamed Haider. He's got really good vision um, and he can play that final pass. Um, but uh, I think. Hopefully, in the future, I'll be able to to have some some more chemistry with any of the the players in the front. And uh, how would you compare the Lebanese football player with the American football player? I think Lebanese footballers are a lot more talented, um, skill wise. Um, I think there's a tactical discipline that American players have. Maybe they grew up with it. Um, in academy and they were taught it and a lot of a lot of american football is is about tactics and uh defending um a lot a, a lot of the lebanese football is is not really tactically uh aware and i think that's the, the biggest difference and how far would you say uh, we are as the Lebanese national team from the U.S. men's national team in terms of level. Not far, to be honest. Not far. We just we we need a, a good system in place. Um, we need uh, good facilities to help us play good football. I mean, when when you pass the ball on good grass, that's kind of slick a little bit. That the ball moves differently. There's there's some rhythm to the game. Um, when you pass the ball on Saida's pitch, I mean, it hits your knees. And the game just is slower. So, I mean, that, that's just one aspect of things. Um, I think if you give the coach a little bit more time to put in his style of play, um, to get the best out of the players too, um, that that's really important. There's a lot of players uh, – that work well with different coaches, that work well in different systems, uh, different formations with different players. Um, I think just a little bit of fine tuning, finding the right players, uh, finding the right system, um, playing on, on a good pitch. Uh, we're not far off from the United States, to be honest. And uh, what, what would you say is your best national team moment so far? The best national team moment that I that I had, um, apart from the debut goal, because uh, that that was like a dream, you know, first goal, first first yeah. game, first goal. Um, I would say when we had qualified for 
the uh, Asia Cup, I was with the squad. And I, I think I had a bruised heel at the time. So I, had, I went up for a header in the training maybe two days before. And I'm not sure what field it was. This was uh, next to Medina. It was a turf field next to Medina. I landed on my heel. And I mean, underneath the turf in Lebanon, it's almost cement. Yeah. So I landed on it, bruised the heel. I was out of the game. I mean, I, I suited up for it. But we had qualified for Asia Cup, and that was, that was a great time. I mean, everyone was happy. I mean, I was personally happy uh, for the, the team, even though I hadn't played. Um, but that was, that was one of the best moments. I wish I had gone to Asia Cup. I think I just missed out on it. Um, but that could have been maybe the best memory. Uh, so you joined Ansar, like I'd say it was a, a bit over a year ago. What, what made you decide to come to Lebanon to play in the Lebanese league, especially knowing that like, it's a bit less professional than what you had been used to before? Um, I think we, you said it early in the interview, um, that I make these decisive decisions. Um, and after my, my time with Indy 11, um, I had gotten a call from, from Lebanon, from Ansar saying that they, they would like to sign me. And I was like, sure, let's do it. You know, let's make it happen. The contract was really good. Uh, you know, there is money in Lebanon, uh, when it comes to, I guess, you know, bringing foreign players or Lebanese players that have played in different countries. Um, so the money was good. It was a four month contract. It was just to finish the rest of the season. Um, so I said, why not? You know, I had nothing, I had no other options at the time um, to go to the MLS. I, it would have required time to wait. And I didn't really want to wait. You know, I just wanted to play football. And I, it was a team that I would have, you know, gotten into immediately. And I did. Um, and, it, and I had done my research about Ansar, you know, I watched some games that they had played the, the tiki taka football that they, they used, they used to play. Um, and they were one of the, the, I think they were the best op offensive statistic team in the league. Yeah. Um, so when I signed for them, you know, it was amazing. Again, first game, first goal I had scored against Safa and, you know, looking at the fans, I was like, yeah. I made the right decision. Um, and it was, I mean, it was fantastic, really. Uh, it was really unlucky at the end where we missed out on uh, the uh, the cup, the FA Cup. Yeah. We lost, but I mean, hats off to Ahed for, for having the team and the run that they did consistently for a couple of years. I mean, those, those teams, they don't come by uh, too often, you know, when you have a team like that. Um, but we, you know, we gave it our all. And I think towards the end of my, my time with Ansar, I, we were negotiating a new contract for two years. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. The, the money made sense. Um, and the terms in the contract made sense as well. I was living in Nami uh, before. Do you, know, do you know where Nami is? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. And in my new contract, I had negotiated specifically, it was written Hamra. So I was like, for sure, you know, and yeah. Hummer is a place that I, you know, when I first came to Lebanon, I was like, I love this place. You know, this is, this is awesome. Um, so that's what made me sign uh, the, the initial contract and then the extension for two years. And um, so were Ansar the only Lebanese team interested in you at the time? I was hearing that, that Nijmi could have been interested, you know, but I'm not sure how specific, you know, how credible that was. Uh, you always have an uncle or someone that says that they know someone that knows someone. That, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it could have been credible. I'm not sure. I, I don't think I received any, I, I hadn't received an offer. Uh, and when you look at it, you know, black and white, if you have an offer, you don't have an offer. You, you, you pick the team that gave you the offer. Yeah. Uh, and, and Ansar was really professional about the whole negotiating process um, to start. Uh, so I was like, you know what? Yeah, this, this is it, Ansar. Which and is the, funny because my, my family, my dad, my uncles, they're, they're big Nijmi fans. My, yeah. my teta, she's a Nijmi fan. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, they grew to love Ansar when I played for them and, you know, they supported me. So it, 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 was, it, was, it was fun. It was funny too. My uncle wouldn't come to, to watch 
<laughs> again. <laughs> and uh, how did you find playing in Lebanon? Like, was it a, a bit easier? I wouldn't say it was easier. I, w I would say it was different um, in terms of, I mean, just the way that the game play, the way that the game is played over there. Uh, I, I think if you factor in the fact that we did, we did have the best offense in the league. So teams respected us more and sat back against us apart from maybe Nijmi, apart from Ahed. Um, and when, when you're playing in the other team's half, it's, it's a lot easier um, to do. If you're an attacking player, it's a lot easier to be successful. You, you make a good run, you receive the ball, uh, you follow up a shot, a rebound, you get a goal. Um, but I would say that the level, like the players are good. The players in Lebanon have skill. Um, I think the only thing that's lacking is maybe tactical awareness, um, which you would receive. You, you would get that tactical awareness if you had played outside of Lebanon because coaches are more demanding. Um, but what I really liked about Abu Zema was that he kind of let us be on the pitch. He let us be ourselves. And that's what brought out the best football. I think. Was that kind of the key to you guys playing such good attacking football? He gave you the freedom. He gave us the freedom. I wouldn't say that he's a tactical genius. Um, and I can't, I mean, from my experience, I don't know any, many coaches that are tactical geniuses uh, when it, like, you know, winning the game single-handedly. Um, but I think his respect for the players, the way that he spoke to us, um, the way that he let us be free, it did play a major role in us being successful and with us playing that attacking style of football. And um, so what was it, could you describe what was it like to play in the derby with Nizmi? <laughs> uh, it was incredible. I mean, you, you hear about this as a kid. Uh, you hear stories about it and you see videos of it, but there's nothing like it. When you, when you step on the pitch, uh, it's crazy. It really is. Uh, it, it's something that's amazing, too, at the same time. I mean, it, it's a wonderful feeling to score against the rival, which, yeah. uh, which I was able to net one uh, in, in the cup. Um, I mean, it, it's definitely a, a different experience from playing in the States. I played in front of 60-something thousand fans when, it, uh, when I played in uh, Kansas City, sporting Kansas City versus Seattle in Seattle. Um, but nothing compared to, to the Lebanese fans because they're a lot more demanding of their players. American fans, they go to the game and their team loses and, ah, oh, no big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, Lebanese fans, it's something about your mom and, <laughs> and you know the rest. Um, yeah. But I remember, I think the, the thing that sticks out is when it, we were warming up, um, Hassan Matu was playing for Nijme at the time. And the fans had some chant about shawarma, ta <laughs> ma shawarma and tawuk. And I was laughing so hard in the warm-up. <laughs> and, and uh, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a fun time. And how would you compare all the leagues you've played in? So you've played U.S., uh, Thailand, and Lebanon. I would say the most demanding league uh, is the MLS. Uh, just based on the exposure that you get. I mean, they analyze every single detail of you on the field. Um, Thailand was demanding as well because when, when you come and you're not a local player, you have to produce and you have to do uh, something special. Uh, I was a little bit unfortunate. My first year in Thailand, I, I tore my meniscus um, and had a really, really terrible rehab, uh, which put me out almost the entire year. Um, so the second year that I was there, my final year in Thailand, I think I was able to enjoy my football and at the same time be successful. Um, I scored some golosos, I remember. Um, and part of me wanted to stay there. I think I was going to, I had an offer from another team there, um, for, for good money to stay there. And I started getting homesick. I, I ended up signing back with Kansas City. Um, and uh, I think that could have been a mistake in hindsight, just because uh, I think it wasn't the right fit. It wasn't the right move at the time. Um, playing the Lebanese league, you know, it's, it's difficult 
because you have a lot of pressure every single game, you know, from the fans, um, from the organization. Um, but I was able to be successful over there um, and, and really kind of get a picture of what Lebanese football is about and show the fans what, what I can do. Um, they're all different. All the leagues are different in their own particular ways. Even here in Korea, I'm sensing a, a difference um, from any league that I've ever played in. Um, it's just everything is fast paced. Over here, it's, it's like, you know, in training, passing exercise, warm up, you just full speed. Um, I think that's going to help me as a footballer. Uh, and if I can bring that experience to the national team, uh, it'll help. And uh, so, do you believe that had the season not been interrupted, uh, you may have gone to win the league of Ansar? Were you guys uh, ready for that? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we would have liked to think that we were in a position to win the league. Um, we, our team on paper was stronger. Um, but, uh, you know, losing that first game, the first derby game of the season to Nijmi, it kind of was deflating. On top of that, losing the, uh, what's the, the, the Elite Cup? Cup. Yeah. The League Cup. Losing that cup was, def was deflating as well. And then the Super Cup was deflating. You know, we had all this expectation before the season. And then we just, boom, lose three games in a row. Um, I, I can't tell you definitely if we were going to win the league. Um, I think we, we could have had a shot to win the league, just like every year. Um, but, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that go into, you know, a team being successful. Uh, for example, last year we had the best attack in the league. And you go into the summer transfer window and you sign another attacking player. And any player that you bring into the team is going to change the dynamics, especially a player like Matu. Um, uh, it, it kind of changed the way that we played. And then you, you add in that we brought in a new coach. Whatever the reason for not keeping Abu Zema, you know, contractually or whatever, homesick, um, you know, that changed the way that we played as well. So I sensed the Ansar team that I played the first four or five months was totally different. Uh, come the start of the season, uh, this last season that got interrupted. And uh, so there's been a lot of talk about uh, why uh, you left Ansar. So could you kind of say what happened? Yeah. Um, it was, you know, I, I had nothing bad to say about the fans. You know, the fans are amazing. Um, you know, I love, I love Ansar as a club. Um, but I think when it came down to it, uh, there was things in my contract that were breached, frankly. Um, and I mean, small things that could have been easily resolved. And then you go to big things, um, that maybe needed a little bit of work, but small things, for example, in my contract I had, uh, when I traveled from the States, they were to pay for my bag. And I arrived in July, submitted the, the receipt. This is before the economic situation. And to this day, still nothing, you know, didn't, yeah. didn't receive a penny for it. Um, I had gotten sick in January and I went to the hospital twice, uh, fever, vomiting, stomach ache, everything, you name it. I was as sick as a dog. Um, I had to pay for my own medical expenses and did not receive anything from the club after giving them my, my receipts. Um, and then my, my apartment as well. Uh, in my contract, like I said, it says specifically in words, Hamra. And I think in January, before we went to Asia Cup, um, my apartment contacted me saying, Ansar said they're going to stop paying for your apartment. Uh, Ansar didn't tell me, hey, like, there's another place in Hamra we could take you to. They said, there's a place in Nami, the same place that you lived in last year. And that place, I mean, nothing against Nami, but, bro, I had to deal with cockroaches and mosquitoes and no AC and paint smells. And it's just, it wasn't ideal. I can't perform at my best if I'm not comfortable at home. 
Um, they, I mean, they didn't even offer a solution apart from that. Um, and they made me pay for my rent for February. And then the, the, the situation of, of the reduced salary, I'm not sure if you, you've heard, um, but in October, the president had a meeting with all of us saying that uh, we're going to accept or we're going to start to pay you 66%. Now, I learned after the meeting what was said because I didn't understand 100% of what, what he was saying. And the players had all agreed to it. You know, they agreed to it saying, oh, we all agree. And I personally didn't agree to it. And learning, learning what was said afterwards, um, when they paid us our rent, and the rent, they said, we're going to pay you rent October, November, December at, at 66%. Um, they made us sign a paper when we were receiving the salary. And on the paper, I specifically wrote, I'm still owed the rest of my salary um, just to cover myself legally. Yeah. And so I, I wrote, I wrote that on there. They just said, okay, yeah. And I mean, keep in mind also for, for October, I think we received the salary November 20 something for November and December. We received the salary end of December and January comes along and I learned that the foreign players were receiving more, more of a percentage. And I was like, wait a second. Why? You know, are, they're not better than any of the domestic. How can the domestic players accept this? And they were like, oh, they live outside of the country, so they need more. And I said, well, I live outside of Lebanon, too. No one's contacting me about this. No one. It's unfair. Even if you live inside or outside, yeah. to pay players more is, is not right. Um, I was just, I mean, my head had kind of gone at that point. Uh, we had signed a new coach, um, signed a new player as well. And I'm thinking, okay, they're cutting down on, on, on budgets and they're signing new players. Yeah. How? Uh, and then I was speaking to my agent too, at this time, you know, informing him, Hey, like, this is what's going on. What do I do? Do I accept it? And I think January comes, we're getting ready to go to, to our first game in the AFC Cup. And my head had gone because I had, I had learned news that uh, I was paying for my own apartment um, out of pocket. So I think my agent messaged uh, the club, said on February 15th after the game, he said, you know, this, he, he sent them an official document saying there's these things, four things in the contract to resolve or to work to uh, it was like a 15 day notice. Um, please resolve them before. And uh, I think he got a voice note back, nothing official, a voice note saying there's a crisis crisis in Lebanon and there's force majeure. And I was like, wait, what do, we, do we need to talk to lawyers about force majeure? Um, and he was like, look, force majeure doesn't apply. If a, the club is still operative. Uh, B, they're still paying their players. And C, if they're still signing new players. I mean, if you're training and players are receiving salary, unless there's a natural disaster, unless there's ISIS in the streets, force majeure doesn't apply. Uh, I think on March 1st, after the 15-day notice, after no response from the club, um, I hired a lawyer. And I went to a notary and served the, the club. I, I terminated my contract. Um, and I was, because I had had it at that point. I was playing out of position as well. Um, I mean, salary was, salaries were late. Uh, I was still paying out of pocket for my rent. Um, the situation in Lebanon wasn't good at all. And um, so I served them on March 2nd. And a week later, I get a, a, an a official document from Ansar saying we're terminating your contract because your performance has dropped um, because you didn't show up to training for the last week. And I sent that to my lawyer and he started laughing. He's like, these guys have no idea what they're doing. Um, it's, it's almost like you break up with your girlfriend and then seven days later, she says, she sends you a text saying it's over. Yeah, it's almost what they did. Um, I mean, I have nothing 
personal against them. I mean, when you have a contract, you have to follow the contract. End of story. Um, and, and, and if you can't follow the contract, at least have dialogue to come to certain terms to agree on something. There was no agreement. They were just saying, this is, this is it. This is what you're doing. Um, and I think that's a little, a little bit of the problem of what Lebanon kind of goes through. Um, you know, when it comes to outside of Lebanon, for example, if you have a contract and you break one thing in that contract, I mean, you can legally terminate the contract and receive everything. Yeah. You know, you can't just follow through 90% of the contract or 80%. You have to follow it. Um, and I think there were, I think maybe that they, they believe that they have people on the inside of the Federation or um, people in the court or a judge that would, would rule in their favor. Um, but I mean, I think in the couple, the, the coming months, I'll have a, um, a formal sit down with my lawyer, uh, and, and plan to proceed accordingly. Um, but I have nothing personal against Ansar. I just, I just want, I wanted them to follow the contract. They had breached it on four different times, on four different occasions. Um, and I guess this, this Ansan in Korea, which sounds like Ansar, it's kind of funny. Um, yeah. And they're green too. Who would have who would have thought? And it's the city that I played in with the national team. Um, it was kind of like a, a gift. Um, it kind of fell into our laps with the window here closing. I was able to put pen to paper um, and then get in to Korea before they closed the airport. So they had closed. They were closing the airport on Wednesday or yeah, Wednesday, and I had received my visa to come to Korea, my work visa, on like Monday night. And then so I, we had booked the flight right away, and boom, just like like that. I left to Korea, I arrived, the airport in Lebanon was closed. Excuse me. Crazy. Yeah, and uh, I mean, this is a pretty common story in Lebanon with players, uh, having these kind of situations, did you ever, like, did you talk to any other player that was going through the same thing? Yeah. Nader, Nader Matar. Um, yeah. Good friend of mine. Uh, he has the same, he had the same situation with Nijman. Um, Nijman was a little bit smarter about how they proceeded. Um, you know, they responded officially with, uh, before the 15 day notice um, that Nader had served them. Um, Ansar didn't, respond until after until after i had um terminated my contract legally um i think nijma also i just read it in the paper there's a brazilian player uh that they yeah. owed money to and fifa ruled in favor of the, the player um i think there's going to be a couple more cases coming uh with this whole you know uh, protest going on in lebanon uh, with a lot of players not receiving what they were owed um so i mean I, I hope that, you know, the players get what they're, what they're owed. Um, it's better for football this way. Uh, it's not good to see um, players getting the short end of the stick. And I think hopefully maybe this is a turning point to make clubs and even the federation run more professionally uh, when it comes to contracts and providing necessary, uh, I guess, amenities or necessary things for the player yeah so you said uh, you talked a little bit about why you you joined korea and how it was kind of like an out for you um uh, how have you found the club so far uh it, it was a incredible experience you know just like suiting up and, and playing with these guys for the first time um it's the second division here but from what I know about Korea um, and from what you probably see in the national team, a lot of good Korean players start here in this league um, and make their way up. And, and this league is also really respected throughout yeah. Asia for that matter. People come from K2, they go to Thailand, they go to China, they yeah. go to uh, the Middle East. Um, so it was a no brainer to say, yes, I want to play in Korea. Uh, when I, when I suited up and I, I saw these players, I said, wow, Every single player here has skill. Every single player here um, physically is up for the challenge. You know, no doubt about it. Um, 
So I was like, I think this, this team that I'm playing on right now uh, is going to help me become a better footballer. Uh, and with the training as well, I came in, we started preseason uh, as well. So, I mean, it hit me like it hit me Yeah, uh, <laughs> running on the Minata. is not the same thing as doing, you know, uh, suicide runs or, you know, sprints here and then going to train in the afternoon. Um, so it took me a little while to adjust. I'm still personally adjusting to the style of play. Um, but I think once I get my feet on the ground, uh, once I get my first goal, um, uh, today I scored a bicycle kick in training. And I don't think Korean players really know about that. Lebanese players, you know, they, they do that when they're young. And, you know, they, they know all about the bike. They always try it. Um, so the, the players were quite impressed today. And I hope I can bring something different to the team. Um, it's funny here in Korea, my name, they call me Saad, Sadda. Uh, that is the name of a rocket by the <laughs> army. <laughs> so they, they found that fitting over here, and I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. And um, how have you found living in South Korea? So far, um, it's kind of cool, man. Experiencing what the rest of the world is going, going through at the moment. Um, although there's no lockdown, things are quite uh you know quiet as well you know everyone's wearing masks there's not too much going on outside uh maybe now actually with the weather changing it's starting to get warmer um i'm starting to see a lot more people out and about um but the life is cool i think the biggest problem that i'm gonna have here is the food man i, I miss me some some barbar or some some good fatouche or tabu there or yeah. uh, something good man uh, uh, but I think over the weekend, I went to this this area uh, in Korea. It's called Itiwan. And there was a lot of um, a lot of Arabic shops. There's a lot of Turkish places. Um, so it, it's about 40, 45 minutes from me. They had groceries too. Uh, the city that I'm in, they don't have groceries. They don't have uh, Arabic groceries. So yeah. I was able to to get some, uh, some tahini, and some spices, zatar, um, and that's going to help me get through. I think once I adjust to to my eating over here, um, I mean, as as you know, diet plays a big role in in the way yeah. that athletes perform. So I think if I if I get that going, um, yeah, I'll start to to improve on the pitch. And um, so, just how much are you looking forward to starting the season uh, next weekend? I almost feel a little guilty. To be honest, because the rest of the world is not playing. All my friends, yeah. they're they're just like they're not even training with the team. So I kind of feel a little privileged, to be honest. Um, but I mean, I'm excited, man. It's been a while since I've played in a game that mattered, um, and in a new country, uh, on a new team. Um, with I mean, I, I hope to go to keep you know improving and and to go somewhere from, from here. Um, so I'm excited. I'm up for the challenge and, uh, I can't wait to, to help this team. I mean, hopefully get pr promoted. That's, that's the plan. Um, there's talk about, I mean, this team finished fifth last year. They had an overhaul with players, 10, 11 players left new coaches. Um, so the expectations are quite low for this team, but it's awesome because I mean, you have nothing to lose. Yeah. and everything to play for. And um, so uh, thank you very much for speaking to us. That's all my questions. And uh, I wish you uh, the best of luck. Thanks, bro. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. And no problem. Thank you.